You know it, you love it. It's time for that end of year trash video. What up, mini family? Welcome to this inaugural end of year or beginning of next year <laughs> clip show where I talk about some things that happened last year, kind of reminisce on them, and also talk about aspirations for the future. So let's get underway. Oh, I'm sorry, my, my little spearmen know they're falling over. I included a wider shot of this video so you could just see the absolute chaos going on now at my desk. The most popular video this year comes as no surprise to anyone. It's the one where I got kicked out of Warhammer World, which makes sense because drama sells. Uh, well, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The most popular Instagram post was of the squad at Adepticon, which is a lot of fun. A lot of people like seeing their favorite content creators all together in the same place. And that's actually one thing that's really special about our hobby is that I don't really think there's one content creator that I dislike in this hobby. They're all really awesome people and I enjoy spending time with them, hanging out with them, swapping ideas. They're all great people. The most popular Facebook post was about me getting kicked out of Games Workshop. <laughs> um, if you don't consider that one, the second most popular was about the painting process for Halgrim, this uh, skeleton captain from Cursed City. And I started to do this a little bit more I find that I have very nerdy thoughts about painting sometimes, and I don't really know where to share them. Obviously in videos, it's fair game, but I thought that maybe every once in a while when I make a Facebook post and I have kind of more of like a weird thought about the model, I can share it in that post. And I did that with this model, had a longer kind of rant about what I was thinking about while painting it, and people seem to like that, so I think I'll keep doing that. <laughs> Look at me, I'm just a content creator. <laughs> Okay, you know what time it is. It's time for them spicy boys. Mean comments can be spicy girls too. We'll figure it out. We'll tell you, we'll tell the gender of the comment. No, I will not be doing that. <laughs> this image is entitled Spice City. Moves into a new studio, true. Gets new piercings, also true. Does a short video every three weeks, Hmm, best of luck. Glad I unsubscribed. Oh, I'm sorry that the rate of my free videos for you isn't fast enough for your non-costing subscription. Some viewers are just so wildly entitled, it blows me away. I don't mind taking feedback from literally any viewer, but the only thing that I ask for is that you just do a tiny bit of research to make sure that what you're saying is actually true. When this video came out, I was producing a video a week and they were like all over 15 minutes long. So it's like, I what? What, do you, what even channel are you looking at? Like, I don't, I don't even know. Like, I'm more upset that I don't understand how someone could be this wrong than the person just making the wrong statement in the first place. Because I want to know, where are you getting your info? This one's called, what the f*** are you saying, bro? PNG. You're probably going to want to ask why I hit subscribe after saying what I'm going to say, but it didn't allow me to comment earlier anyway. The sentence just ends there. I've been building World War II planes and starships for the last 14 years. Oh no. Never used an airbrush in just five minutes and 36 seconds into your video? I don't think I wanna start. Well, I guess we failed Eric's, what I think is channel here. He's abbreviating the word channel in the title of his channel. You know, way to be efficient. It is so negative and so technical, I don't know if you're trying to impress your nerd friends or get us who never use an airbrush, never pick one up. Absolutely, my intent is to not get you specifically you, Eric's channel, to pick up an airbrush. And so I guess in that in that regard, I was successful. I'm feeling a little angry right now. Where's this anger coming from? Eric's channel, I love you. Sorry, I doubt if I watch the rest of your video. And I know you're going to say, but you should, you should, you turn me off already. <laughs> okay, the title of the image makes sense now. Again, if you're gonna get spicy and salty with me, like just, just proofread a little bit, you know, just do a little, just do a little research of your own writing, just to make sure what you're saying, maybe has a little punctuation, you know, makes any fucking sense. Okay, I said I was angry earlier, I'm trying to bounce back. Okay, breathe. <sighs> Gage deers and a bull ring, every day you look more and more like a lesbian. Dad, who gave you a YouTube account? Since I got a septum piercing and stuff like that, and also like dyed the tips of my hair blonde, I get a lot of comments about like my physical appearance, and it really shocks me how many people like give a sh It's like if the content is interesting, if you're learning from it, if it's entertaining, if you're being engaged to stay and watch the video, like 
Who cares what the presenter looks like, you know? You know? I want to be like this guy when I grow up. He clearly has no idea how acrylic paint works, nor any color theory, but his video still got 200k views. F***ing skill, bro. Skill, bro. Get on my level. You gotta fake it till you make it, okay? Nope. Not watching egotistical individuals get their egos boosted more. Not quite unsubworthy, but rather damn close. <laughs> I appreciate that Bangalore Wolf here is letting me know when I get close to unsubworthy so I can adjust the direction of my channel. Appreciate it, Bangalore. This guy's name is Virtual Holocaust. I'm sure this will be a great comment. Oh, fuck it, eh? How to say you're a liberal without saying you are a liberal. Ha ha, bro, it was funny because your mouth was open and your glasses were upside down. Ha ha ha. Dude, why does upside down glasses guy have to be political? Like, why can't this just be like dumb and funny, okay? Why do we gotta politicize everything? I'm doing it again, I'm getting angry, I'm getting salty. Daniel K says, couldn't you just get back to normal without those accessories in your face? God damn it, dad, you made a second YouTube account? People care, they care about what this looks like, okay? They're like, man, your face is so good looking that you shouldn't tarnish it with accessories. We care about your fit. That's really what Daniel K is saying here, he's like, I'm concerned with the image you're putting out there because it's so good that you wouldn't want to spoil it. Daniel K, thank you. And that's it for 2023 in the spicy comments. Thank you all to our applicants this year and also for the winners. Now, on to some comments. All right, number one question. There were several of you curious about my ongoing relationship with GW. And I would say that it is non-existent. I have been communicated with them, they have been communicated with me, but there are still some ongoing things. Number one, they owe me money in two instances. I shipped not only the Primark that they spitefully did not show at Warhammer World, and also my commission artist's army that he painted to Warhammer World, two different payments, and they said they were gonna pay us back for that. I have not been paid back for that. And two, out of the goodness of their hearts, they chose to send me their entire paint range. I didn't ask for it, they offered it, and I politely accepted it. And when I picked it up from UPS, I had to pay some $100 or $200 to get it, like a strange customs fee, which was weird because we never really have to pay customs fees here in the United States. They said they'd pay for that as well. And they have invoices for all of these things. They even have multiple versions of them because they've asked for them multiple times and I still haven't been paid yet. So I don't know what's going on there. Let me turn the floor over to GW here. After you found the obvious mastermind of leaks, how are you guys doing dealing with massive leaks for your rules? It's almost like I made a mistake and I was never part of the problem in the first place. I will say that at some point this year, and I've been wanting to do this for a long time, I want to make one month where I, myself, uh, and also I encourage other content creators to make videos about other companies. Just one month this year, this is gonna do a lot of things. I think namely it's going to shed some light on smaller manufacturers in our space. There are just so many out there that I have discovered this year and like genuinely love. Um, like the 32 mil scale models they produced and like even more. And I wanna shed some light on them. But two, maybe it'll make GW realize in that one month where they have less content being made for them, the value of content creators. Uh, so that's my plan regarding GW for this coming year. This was a big year with the addition of the podcast and studio. You seem like a DIY Midwesterner. How do you decide what projects slash skills you should learn to do yourself and what you should hire out? This includes production and every other behind the scenes stuff we don't see. I love to do everything on my own, but I've realized in this last year, slash two years, that I can't do that without just like wasting a ton of time. Um, and so the questions that I have to ask myself are basically, can anyone else accomplish what I want to do to a reasonable level with little to no intervention? And if the answer to that question is yes, then I will find someone else to do it. And so for instance, like finding food for people, like I don't need to do that, okay? Like other people can do that and I can focus on things that only I can do. Uh, another, another example is like some kind of carpentry work. Like I have a friend, uh, Nathan, who's super capable with carpentry and I can just give him my idea and he can bring his own ideas uh, that are better than mine and he can execute in a, in a great way. Alex, my assistant editor, is getting better and better at editing. Um, through working on the courses for my Kickstarter campaign, which I'll we'll also talk about in future questions, he has learned a lot about like the way that I like videos to be. And with every like session that we do together, I get more and more confident that I can like hand off a lot of assistant editing work to him and even more intense editing work. So 
uh, I can hand off whole videos to him possibly in the future when he like fully understands what I like a video to look like. Are you happy with your studio or are there some things you would like to change? Largely, I'm very happy with the studio. Um, there are still some things to check out, like some of the uh, noise in the space. Some headphone users are kind of talking about how they can hear a pretty low noise floor despite using noise removal and stuff like that. I want to figure that out. The videography section of my studio is actually a lot smaller than I would like in an ideal world. I find that my light fixtures are often encroaching into like the editing area because the, the stands I use are so large. Um, so a bigger space would be nice. And even a larger ceiling would be nice. I can't boom my light above me if I'm standing in front of my background. It has to be more like pointed at my face straight on. So a higher ceiling, a bigger space for doing videography would be nice, which is, which is funny to say because like we're shooting video goddamn miniatures here. Like why does it need to be that big? But honestly, the bigger it is, the bigger the fixtures, the bigger the, the freedom to move around, uh, the bigger everything. So yes, a bigger space there would be nice, but that's not really a solvable issue necessarily. Also regarding the studio, what has been the most unexpected thing about moving into a new studio space? Couriers, like delivery people, uh, will just walk into your space, like totally unannounced. Like in a residence, they'll like ring on the doorbell and then uh, you'll come and answer it. But in a office space like this, they'll just come in. Uh, so it creates interesting situations where you have like Jimmy John's arrive in the middle of a live stream. And the door to get into the office is, is right there. It's, it's 10 feet away from me. So it's like, it's unavoidable that they would notice you and you would notice them like while you're doing something. <laughs> What's been your biggest disappointment slash setback this year? If you have, how did slash are you overcome slash overcoming it? Honestly, the biggest setback this year was probably the Kickstarter campaign, which is not to say that it wasn't worth it, both monetarily and also like just for my audience. But the tale of a Kickstarter campaign is so long um, that you need to keep focusing energy on it while you are also trying to continue doing your normal day job to keep making money for your operations. I think at this point in the campaign, with all of the added expenses uh, from shipping, uh, storing things at fulfillment centers, paying for extra stuff after the campaign, I'm pretty sure we're, we're getting close to breaking even in terms of like not making uh, any money, which again, not a problem. The money came to me at a good time when I needed it and I reinvested it in my channel. It's kind of like a loan in a way. Um, and also there's a ton of product here in my studio that I will be able to sell after the campaign and, and make profit from. So it's not like a, an issue that I broke even at this point and didn't make any money. Um, but yeah, like there's a lot of things I have to focus on with the channel while also trying to engage and make backers feel confident in your ability to keep working on what you said you were gonna keep working on. And I am, it's just hard to juggle both of those things. I also got a question about whether or not I wanna do another Kickstarter campaign in the future. And at this moment, the answer is definitely no. At some point, I wanna make a video about running and producing a Kickstarter campaign and kind of like my thoughts about the process. I wanna do that when I've finished the full process so I can talk about the entire thing. But yeah, this, uh, this takes so much work to do that I could only ever see myself doing a campaign again if I like hired someone to just own the entire process. If I ever wanna make a model again in the future or make like video courses again in the future, I'll just make the model and sell it right away. I, I won't bother with a campaign. I only bother with a campaign if I have a product that I need that I literally can't afford to produce without some kind of like, you know, backer loan in the beginning. And even then I'm gonna think long and hard about is it worth to make this thing? Cause it really is a lot of work. What are your aspirations this year for the hobby? Well, I wanna finish up the Age of Sigmar army that I'm working on in my Northern Conquerors Escalation League. It's going along pretty well. I got almost my entire 20 man unit of uh, Grave Guard proxies here in front of me, ready to rock. That's the next project that I'm working on for them. I would love to also paint a larger chunk of my Greyjoy army for A Song of Ice and Fire so that we can do uh, a little cheeky Kill Your Friends video with uh, Curtis playing A Song of Ice and Fire at some point in the year. Um, I'm gonna expand this question to aspirations for my channel in general, as, long, as well as my hobby. I would love to strike a healthy work-life balance uh, for myself by the end of the year as well. Uh, my last couple of videos, 
I think the last four have all ended in me pulling like all nighters or being here in the office until like, until like four in the morning, try to finish a video in time for a sponsor to review. I used to have a situation in the past where I would have a video done a week ahead of time so people could review it for like a week before I actually needed it. And that just saved me a lot of heartache. And so I've kind of fallen into my like <laughs> bad high school tendency of like doing homework right before uh, the due date. So I kind of want to try to figure that out. I've taken that so seriously that I've actually hired a life coach for myself to kind of like work through some of the struggles that I have with my current day-to-day -day job and how I can fix them and, and, and feel differently about them and, and all that stuff. Beyond just trying to deal with work-life balance, the other improvement that I want to make to the channel this year is just to focus more on the channel. I feel like last year we had a lot of non-YouTube focuses and not only did my painting like languish for it, but also all the metrics on my channel also languished. So I want to focus more on YouTube, make more content, make some bigger content, and I want to talk about how I'm going to do that in another couple questions. What is something that you accomplished this year in the hobby that you're really proud of? What gave you the biggest sense of accomplishment? You know, I really kind of tackled speed painting. Before this point, I didn't really know how to paint a model to a fast degree and be happy with it. And I don't necessarily know the best way to do that even still right now, but I think I'm getting a lot better at and speed painting the way that I like to do it. It's always really inspiring and encouraging when you take this black box of something you're trying to learn how to do and you open it up and you kind of figure out what's going on inside of it. So now it's no longer a black box, it's like a translucent box. You have some idea of, of what this process can look like. It's like putting another tool in your tool belt that you can like use for the future. So now I feel a lot more confident like going into painting my Greyjoy army and stuff like that. I think I learned a lot of that from painting like squads for skirmish games. If you're looking to paint like a large army and you're like, I don't know where to begin, it can be a lot easier to think about like how to paint a squad of dudes versus how to paint an entire army and have it look cohesive. Like start with just having a small squad look cohesive and that can be a lot smaller of a bite to chew. I am someone who has been wanting to get into painting miniatures for over a year, but I've felt overwhelmed by what minis I should get, what paints to buy for those minis, and just the sheer amount of choices to make. How could I step over this hurdle? I think this question from Jacob is a pretty standard question that a lot of people have in a lot of different hobbies. There are always so many choices to make and I don't really know where to begin. And as someone who also likes to min-max every choice that you could make, I understand where the frustration comes from in this question. I think one way you can get over this question is by removing the pressure on yourself to make these choices. Uh, talking about paint ranges specifically, a lot of the ones that you see in videos, uh, you see people using, you see probably available in your local store or Amazon bestsellers. A lot of those paint ranges um, are totally adequate and you can get amazing results with. Like the differences between Scale 75 and AK Interactive or Vallejo or Citadel, a lot of the difference between those ranges is, is very minimal. Um, it's like nuance that you would only really notice if you were kind of like deep in it. So as a beginner, just pick up whatever you can get your hands on and you'll be more than enough dangerous to get really nice results on your mini painting. In some sense, proving to yourself that you're also gonna stick with this hobby is a good thing. Because if you buy a bunch of stuff and do all this research and then never end up uh, like using it more, then it was really a waste of your time. Um, so you shouldn't spend all your time and energy doing all this unnecessary research before you kind of prove to yourself that this is something you wanna do for a while at least. You've previously mentioned an interest in playing as many different games as possible to get a broad understanding of different rule systems. Do you have any intentions on playing bolt action in the near future? Yes. I know that a lot of games like bolt action, battle tech, historical games, they get a bad rap from me. And that's largely because the aesthetic of the game isn't interesting to me, but I know for a fact those games have interesting mechanics that I would love to learn. And so at some point I will play both of these games uh, maybe even multiple times, just to kind of like understand what they're doing well, what I enjoy about them. But yeah, absolutely, bolt action, definitely on the table. Do you feel like it is easier to grow as a painter now with the plethora of content on YouTube or harder because of the sheer volume of very quality paint shots, potentially discouraging the average painter? 
I feel like it kind of depends on the average player's persona. If you're the kind of person who gets discouraged by really nice paint jobs, and if that's the majority of hobbyists, then obviously the answer to the question is that it's largely negative that there's this much content. But if you're not that kind of person, like I don't feel like I'm that kind of person, like people's amazing box art do not discourage me from painting that same model, for instance, then it wouldn't be a negative thing. I think my first inclination is to think that it's a good thing, it's a positive thing, but that also is my personality. I tend to think that everyone thinks like me and that that isn't the case um, at all. It depends, <laughs> I don't know. What was the weirdest or wildest fan interaction you had this year? Uh, I think at Tup Live at Adepticon, I think it was pretty hilarious that some people were eating canes at Tup Live, like in the room with us. That was pretty fun. Do you find the good detailed models are needed to improve your painting? I love this question. To an extent, maybe? You can learn a lot on bad models, but it can be really discouraging. If I was in that kind of like middling skill level and I was trying to paint Simon board game miniatures, I think I'd find that pretty frustrating. Nicer models are just nicer to paint. Um, and so they're, they're more fun. The more encouraging. Honestly, I hate it so much when uh, tools get in my way. Like when a paint, a paintbrush, a model is just getting in the way of my artistic vision. It's just so frustrating. So if having a better model is going to encourage you to paint better, to try more things, um, that can be a great thing. That being said, I really do enjoy painting board game models, uh, largely because they are very simple. Uh, they don't have a ton of like BS all over the model. Um, so it, it's a little bit of both. Do you find having high standards for your work confining or liberating? Sometimes I wish I fell on the ignorance is bliss side of things and could just crank out minis I felt good about, but might barely be tabletop instead of trying to always get better. I don't actively think about the answer to this question. I, at no point in my painting process am I like, man, I'm confining myself so much and it's limiting my output. I think thinking about your output is probably bad. I'm kind of more excited about like this new addition that I'm painting adding to my army and it's how it's gonna change what the army looks like and how it plays like. If you are an outcome dependent person, you're just, you're not gonna have as fun where else do you think about the outcome in terms of time expenditure? It's at your work, you know? I put in this amount of hours, I'm gonna get paid this much, which will enable me to do these things. And with the hobby, it's not about the outcome. It's like you are having fun in the process. You are having fun playing games right now. You're not excited about putting a W on your record. You're having fun painting miniatures right now. It's okay to be excited about the finished product as well with painting, obviously that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think focusing like 80% of your energy on the outcome is probably a negative thing. And honestly, I don't know if you need to hear this or if someone else needs to hear this. If you don't like painting miniatures, maybe the hobby isn't for you. And that isn't a bad thing, you know? I would love to have an answer for those who like to play the games but don't like to paint the models or assemble them. Like obviously commissioning your, your stuff is like a solution or buying, uh, buying models secondhand. Just figure out when Eons of Battle is gonna sell their next army on eBay and then buy it at a super low cost so that uh, Jay can get more depressed. What's your favorite miniature you painted this year? I love this question. I think my favorite miniature I painted this year is either the Void Spirit model, just because that sculpt really exceeded my expectations for what someone on Fiverr would have been able to accomplish with like well, maybe like one or two rounds of feedback. Like that, that person, I think his name was Felix, did a great job sculpting a 32 mil model. And it was, it was really good. It, and the paint job was, was, was good too, like Void Spirit. I love Dota 2, that was, that was a fun video. I think the other one was the Blood Rage Viking. It's been a skill that I've been chasing for a long time to paint a board game model to look like it isn't a board game model. And uh, I think with that model, like I, I really achieved that. I was like, dang, like this looks like a quality mini and it totally isn't. Uh, so that was really encouraging. Um, and I, it's sitting, it sits on my desk next to me because I have no uh, display case yet in the office. But I love looking at it. I think uh, it just really makes me happy. It's like, a, it's like a tick in the box in terms of like skills that I am able to, to do now. What do you think about next for your hobby products? More minis, paintbrushes, a coffin bed? I think if I were to make any 
any new products. I have the most unique ideas for how to make wet palettes better, but I'm really put off of doing Kickstarters as mentioned previously. So I'm not really trying to figure out how to manufacture a wet palette. I have a lot of really, really cool ideas for models. I have been uh, cultivating a like a, a mood board for uh, models for like the last two years. And it has just so many ideas ready to go that I just can't wait to make models out of. Uh, I just don't want to work on a, another product before I finish fulfilling the stuff that I have going on in my life right now. That would feel irresponsible. And I think it would just, it would take energy away from what needs to get done right now. Now that you are also a small business owner with staff, has this changed the ideas pipeline for videos? What projects of yours could you rewind time on and give a second crack? So the video idea pipeline hasn't changed, but I would say uh, it needs more structure. So at the beginning of the month, I wanna have a chat with my editor uh, and my wife as well about what videos I wanna make this month and who needs to do what. Whether that's live streams, whether that's uh, podcasts, whether that's videos. I wanna kinda lay the groundwork for the month, have it all figured out, work on that, and then do the same thing at the beginning of every single month. If there are longer projects that my editor needs to work on, we're gonna meet once a week to kinda see his progress, see where he's at, see if he needs help. I think the biggest issue with employees is that they need your attention. Uh, no one's gonna care about your company more than you do. And so those people are gonna seek you out to answer questions about your company. And so one thing I had to kind of tell people who were in this space with me is that if you're working and you encounter a question and that question isn't a blocker, just keep working until you get to a blocker. And then when you do, then come to me with you know four questions, I'll answer all of them and then there'll be less interruptions. Um, so yeah, those are all kind of my thoughts. Why is everyone in the hobby older than 30 and why can't I find someone in their early 20s to hang out with who I can relate to? I mean, that's a that's an interesting question that I've never really thought about. I feel like a lot of the content creators are kind of also that 30 year old range as well. And maybe, I don't know if this is true, but maybe it has to do with the cost. You know, the majority of people who play this game play games workshop games. And man, those games are getting more and more expensive and I don't really, Notice that because a lot of that stuff I get, I like already have, or I buy secondhand, or I get for free from the companies because I'm a big YouTuber and whatever. I don't really realize how expensive this hobby can get. And as a 20 year old, you know, you're in college, um, you have some crappy job, or like, you know, you're younger and you're kind of just entering into your career field. Um, you don't have a lot of disposable income. So maybe that's why there aren't many younger 20 year olds playing the hobby. But you know, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, post on your local gaming groups on Facebook, you know, you know, looking for people my age to have fun with and enjoy the hobby with. You know, if, if you want that, you know, go out there and seek it out. At what point exactly does a mini become small or how big is too big if you want to say it in a boring way? How very Shakespearean is this question? There is no definition, but for me, you stop being a miniature and become a bigature, which is a fantastic term I learned from Zorba Zorp, right after the 75 millimeter scale. Like that's the biggest model that I'll paint that I consider a mini. When you get into the 90 millimeter range and higher, we're talking scales here, not, not necessarily height. That's when it becomes more of a statue or, or something larger than, than, a, than a miniature. If you had to start your channel slash business from scratch, what would you do differently? This question kind of has two angles. One, people who are looking to start a channel want to hear the advice, and I think that's important. And two, it could be discouraging to people who want to start a YouTube channel because they're like, what are all these things I have to figure out? So I'm going to answer it in two ways. I wouldn't change anything about the start of my channel because it got me to where I am right now. And that sounds cliche and lame, but it's the honest to God truth. Like I can look back on my history as a YouTuber and see immense growth. And just like with the hobby and painting miniatures, I get immense satisfaction from that. I feel like any change that I would make to my channel would just make it seem like it was more, I don't know if corporatized is the right word. Like I'm very obsessed with this idea of seeming like a massive company while just being one person working on the videos. I don't know why I'm obsessed with that, but I just seem to kind of go for that angle. Like I want everything to be like a Netflix show. That being said, I might try to 
create a sustainable business model that doesn't include sponsorships. And I might try this out in 2023 if I can convince Amber. <laughs> I feel like sponsorships are kind of a drag sometimes because the whole awesome part about being a YouTuber is that you are your own business owner, so you can make your own choices. And the moment you involve someone else and their money, you have to consider their opinion. And so I can't like publish a video, at least the way I do my business, um, until the person has seen the ad and approves. Uh, just because I don't want to create a situation where I put something out on the internet that someone paid for that they're dissatisfied with. So before anything gets published, I wanna make sure that the person likes what they're paying for. Um, so, but because of that, you know, I feel this need to, you know, have them approve before it goes live, which means that I have to wait for their approval. That can be kind of a drag sometimes when you wanna just post a video. There are a lot of ways to make money on YouTube that don't involve sponsorships. Um, one of the bigger ones is having your own products to sell, you know, essentially sponsoring your own videos with your own content. And I think that you could definitely make a living uh, without sponsorships. I would, I would try to do YouTube without involving anyone else's money or, or ads. Saying that though, there is nothing wrong with sponsorships if that's what you do or you're interested in doing. In oil painting, often you paint dark to light on a canvas. Does a 3D object follow some of the same rules? from Shoreview, Minnesota. It can. Uh, I feel like in this last year, I've done a lot of dark to light painting. And also I've done a lot of observing about what that does to your painting process when you take that approach. Um, the other alternatives being starting in a mid-tone, going up and down, starting at a highlight and going just down. I've never done that before. That sounds kind of crazy, but totally doable. Um, I've discovered that when you start from a dark area and go to light, you need to have kind of a really good mastery, or maybe mastery is a little bit too intense of a word, a really good understanding about what you want the final color to look like. This is the advantage of starting from the mid-tone. If you start from the color you want your model to look like, you know exactly how much you can take away uh, via adding highlights and via adding shadows to not obscure that mid-tone, because you're already there. If you're starting from a shadow, you need to work into your mid-tone, and, and often you don't create enough space uh, for your mid-tone to exist on the model by the time you reach it when you're highlighting. <laughs> this is so intensely nerdy. So yeah, you need to understand how much, how dark you can go, like how much space to carve out for your mid-tone at the time you reach that brightness. So yeah, it, it, it is it's a thing that uh, hobbyists do for sure on models. I don't think the 3D nature of the model has much to do with it, um, but it's an interesting thing to talk about nonetheless. Boom! That's gonna do it for all the questions this year, guys. Thank you so much for sticking around for this year. This year was a, was a weird one for me, just because like the first quarter of the whole year was basically moving into the studio and running a Kickstarter campaign. I looked back at the number of miles I painted this year, and it, it, I think it was like 42 or 50, some, somewhere in there. And I thought I would have painted a lot more models this year because toward the end of the year, I got into army painting. Um, but man, at the beginning of the year, I wasn't really painting a lot, and that's because of all, all that stuff that I was doing. Um, I'm really looking forward to like, moving past that, being a normal YouTuber again, finding that work-life balance, making funny content, making more content, making, making some of the older videos I used to make, like skits and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to all of that, but I'm really thankful you guys stuck around. I'm thankful you guys kind of supported uh, my creative endeavors this year, whether it was the Kickstarter campaign, watching my videos, uh, watching like the move-in videos for The Office, like all that stuff. All of that stuff is support, and I appreciate all of it, like really, truly. So thank you so much for, for being around and just being patient with me this year. Um, there's a lot of just kind of big changes going on and you know, it's hard to kind of uh, manage all of them sometimes. Thank you especially to my patrons. I don't think I have a more patient bunch of supporters than them. If you're interested in supporting me, that's one of the best ways that you can do it and maybe one of the best ways for me to kind of not have sponsorships on the channel as uh, the Patreon campaign. That thing linked down in the description below and there are a bunch of fun things to leverage with the Patreon, namely the Discord server. Uh, the Discord server is really a huge thing in and of itself that has 
a painting challenge that goes on year long with quarterly uh, challenges and also year round things to earn points on. So you can be on a leaderboard to see who's painting the most stuff. You can get feedback from people in the uh, CNC channel or the miniatures channel. There's kind of a lot going on there. So definitely check it out. You can buy my model, the Duchess, and also a class that I made for the Duchess that teaches you how to paint the model stroke for stroke. Uh, I also have the new Wood Elves and everything that I did in the Kickstarter campaign coming to my web store uh, once all of the backers have been fulfilled. Uh, the last thing we're looking to do with backer fulfillment is just finish up casting the 32 millimeter models. And then once those are done, then everyone can get fulfilled at the same time. I'll do it for this video, guys. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to...